Greetings, as I, Tatus Naramankuk, your lord and emperor here at the Jacobin Empire, and welcome one and all. I hope you're having a great day. Today, we're going to be diving deep into more tabletop discussions and talking more about Pathfinder, its lore, and its world of Galarian. I've been doing a bunch of these videos. I hope you check them all out and uh, enjoy them. Today, I'm going over a human ethnicity, another one, Ushuanti. Um, we're going to be discussing it in detail, going over as, as much stuff as I have provided from a number of books. But again, like, I use a combination of looking over the books that are optional uh, that I'm going to go over, just looking in them, and using a lot of information from the Pathfinder Wiki. Uh, in the Pathfinder Wiki ends up being mostly my outline, and then I add things as I need to from the books. But for you, if you want to dive deeper than just this information, I, as I always, I recommend the books I'm going to talk about. So why don't we start with that, and then we'll talk about the Schwanti a little bit here. And my question for the day, if you're either joining me live as I record this on Twitch or in the YouTube chat, have you played Schwanti? Just as a curiosity. Um, I know there's a couple of people playing uh, one officially a Schwanti and one adopted in my current uh, campaign, Crimson Queen. So that's another reason why we're talking about it today. So, campaign settings. One of the early books that I would recommend checking out for this is same with Inner Sea World Guide. Uh, these had some basic information about a lot of human ethnicities and introducing to the Shawanti. But this is very basic stuff. Uh, you're not going to get a lot of information from there. The books that are going to be better for you are, of course, a guide to Corvosa, because Corvosa has a history of the Shawanti, which we'll talk about today. Uh, a History of Ashes, which is, in fact, a book in the Crimson Queen. Uh, Curse of the Crimson Throne, which is what adventure path we're using for the Crimson Queen uh, adventure that we're doing. It's the one that it's based off of, that I'm using as an outline for my adventure. This is the fifth, uh, I think, fourth or fifth book here, uh, History of Ashes. And one of the things that it does in this book is give a detailed description on the region the Sochuanti live in and their culture. I would definitely recommend this one if you're going to do more research than anything. And the big Crimson Queen book will probably have it there, too. Uh, the other one would be Verisia, Birthplace of Legends, because, <coughs> technically speaking, this is the Verisian territory. I have a Verisian video where I talk about the territory. You could also check that out. All right. So this is a good man here who is a Shuanti that is a little bit non-traditional. He's in Sandpoint. This is Bellor uh, Hemlock. You deal with him uh, if you are in um, Rise of Runelords. So the Shuanti are a nomadic people that live in the Storval Plateau and the Belish Uplands in the Varisian region. Uh, some of them live in the edges of the hold of uh, Belkazin and even in the land of Lindorn Kings. They are there for a variety of reasons, but if you really get down to the nitty gritty of it, which we're going to talk about their overall history, they are related to the Varisians as they are both groups of humans that had been enslaved workers of the ancient Thessalonian Empire. And when Thassalon fell during Earthfall, had a chance to develop and their own culture and advance that culture of their own. So let's talk about that history, because that's the important part about defining who the Shawanti people are. And here's some uh, of our iconic adventurers, uh, basically, dealing with Shawantis and their culture. So the original Shawanti people, as they would have been, dates back over 10,000 years to that time before Earthfall, as I talked about, during the Thassalonian Empire. Many beings were enslaved by the Rune Lords, and those that were uh, be would become the Shawanti were actually being trained to be a basic warrior caste for the Thassalonians, for the Rune Lords. When Earthfall then occurred, the remaining Shuanti that survived the Great Destruction did the best they could survive through the Age of Darkness, similar to Varisians and a lot of the other people. The Shuanti, in this way, share a lot of ancestors with the Varisians, the Olfin, and the Kelid people, all people that had this influence of the Thessalonian Empire. The Shuanti language itself is actually a combination of all of those three languages, Varisian, Olfin, and Kelid, with a bit of Thessalonian. Uh, so it has that influence between them and a connection between these different ethnicities. I've talked about the Parisian ethnicity before, but I'll eventually talk about the Ulfin and Kelid peoples too. So, within the Varisian lands where their primary settlement was, which is the 
ancient core of what was Thassalon. The Shawanti people lived in a relative peace, especially with their close neighbors, the Varisians, who lived in that territory. And most of the time, their conflicts came to the monsters and beasts that were in this region. Uh, possibly things from the old Belkazin with the raiding orcs from the east, uh, in contact with some of the barbarian people in the north for the land of Lamorne kings. So it was like the area of Varesia and the peoples within that relatively were peaceful themselves. And <sighs> the thing is, Varesia itself has not been, even with its colonization now, still is pretty rugged, uh, difficult, harsh landscape to be in. It's why a lot of Varesia isn't colonized. It's a very harsh landscape. It is a very wild landscape with very difficult creatures and a mixture of harsh empires, even though theoretically the environment is settleable. And that's a reason why the Chelish Empire, when they did their expansions, discovered the area of southern Beresia and Bloodsworn Vale, and in 46, 4406 in that area, basically began colonizing there. Because as much as Varesia is a harsh place to live overall, it is a livable place if you would be able to tame the wilderness. It's a dangerous, powerful wilderness. But people that were living there, the Shuanti and Varesians, were facing an actual enemy at this point. Now, not to say that the other threats they hadn't faced were enemies, but this was a new uh stress factor on their existence there. Varesians were better at integrating newcomers. There were some cultural clashes, uh, some difficult difficulties, some difficulties with coexistence, with prejudices and misunderstandings, but the Varesians were able to adapt and were a very adaptable culture in this way. And in this way, if we compare it to what kind of happens with the Shuanti, well, Varesians had very harmonious interactions overall. It, not to say it was great, but it was nothing compared to the poor Shawanti of how they were mistreated. They had a much smaller presence in the ancient lands uh, than the Varesians, and that's an important thing to note about. Their presence within Varesia was much smaller than Varesians. They lived in uh, clan-based communities known as Quas, uh, which, let me just see if there's any Which we'll talk more about when we talk about the tribes of the Shuanti in a little bit. But the Cheliacs basically came in there, and the first thing they did was establish the colony of Corvosa, which was right in the heart of Shuanti territory. And this city included their sacred pyramid. Now, I will tell you, the entire plot of Curse of the Crimson Throne and, you know, what my adventure is, the Crimson Queen deals with a bit of that. They built some stuff on top of an ancient sacred pyramid. There's some stuff there. Things get messed up. You know, it's, you know, especially with theirs, uh, you know, if you've watched Crimson Queen, the king died. There's a lot of stress going on, a lot of crazy things going on. And I will tell you, it sparks something from an ancient pyramid, which becomes the big bad kind of thing of the entire series. It's a bit more complex than just that, and has a lot more nuance, which is one of the reasons I like the adventure. But you can see, it was not a great idea for Corvosa to build on top of a sacred pyramid that the Shuanti weren't worshipping, they were guarding. So, but nonetheless, the Shuanti wanted to keep doing their job. So there was a conflict between these Chelyas colonists, because they aren't independent yet, they are still Chelyax people, and the Shuanti. And for many, many years, it was a prolonged bloody, bloody battle between the two of them. And from that time in 4406, it was conflict until about 4488, when this was when the colonists uh, emerged uh, victorious. Yes, C linking to the pyramid and the Shawanti people links to the overall plot of some of the things going on. The, though there is a lot more political machinations and things that are manipulative in the system, it's a very interesting series that does actually have a linking kind of narrative of, you know, things that are going on and leads into the more difficult enemies that you're going to fight. Because, like, right now you're fighting, like, you know, bandits and thugs and stuff like that, and that can be pretty, like, tough stuff uh, at most. And that ramps up to stuff that you get a lot of levels. Well, what can you fight with that? Well, you know, hey, an ancient evil awoken. You know, it's that kind of thing, as, as part of this entire thing, which... It's a little bit more, as I said, it's a lot more complex than all of that. 
but it will be related to that. It, it, the pyramid is an important part of it. Which is the castle now! <laughs> so, that's another problem. That's the, the entire thing. These, like, you know, the royals and most of the important nobles are in the place that is this ancient pyramid all the time. Hence why you do have this entire thing that I was talking about, where, you know, nobles, some of them drove a little bit of the violence here, too. Is that connected with things that happens at the pyramid, or is it something else now? And, you know, you don't know that now, but definitely there is uh, something there. But So, Cheliax won. Uh, the con the con these people won, and the Bay of Corvosa is known as Conqueror's Bay now, because they conquered this territory, but the Laxians did. And Corvosa is the largest city in Varesia of the city-states that are there. There's like three or four city-states now that are within it. I would have to remember them all. And I'm planning on talking about each of them individually. But Corvosa was the first. It was it's the largest, you know. And it's unfortunate that Jeshuanti themselves had to abandon this homeland and re re relocate to even harsher wilderness. Remember, Varesia is a harsh wilderness. So the Shuanti people had spent thousands of years carving out an area in it where they were at relative peace and relative safety. Still had threats from the wilderness, still had threats from other areas, but were relatively peaceful, relatively safe. Now they've been driven in from it, and they were driven to the Storval Plateau, where they arrived in 4507. There's unfortunately still a lot of prejudice against the Shuanti people in Corvosa, even though they have broken away from Chelyax. A lot of that old prejudices against them from the conflicts before, and even on the Shuanti end, most of them remember the invaders coming in and settling this place. There are those that adapt and live in a more modern time, or are more able to forgive, because honestly, the people have been living here for a number of generations, they aren't the people that originally came here, and there are plenty of people that aren't at fault. Probably blame certain people, like I would say probably the nobles of Corvosa are still probably blamed a lot more than, let's say, the general rabble of it. But there is still this deep animosity that exists between the two people left over there because of this, unfortunately. Uh, there's Schwanti fighting a ogre. So, um, the main thing that you would notice with a Shuanti person is they have skin tones that a uh, uh, widely vary from uh, pretty deeply tan to dark brown, but most of them have kind of ruddy complexion. Other than that, they are very standard human. Uh, it's just kind of darker skin tones overall. And that ruddy complexion is the average. So again, variety can vary between them. When we talk about their culture, which is a lot of times where the Shawanti stand art, is the thing is their culture has been formed as a warrior culture. And I think that's important to talk about them because that influence of the Thessalonians as being a warrior caste and being descended from that still remains in them. And it especially remains because of the hostility of the Varesian area. They are nomadic, but they were never nomadic to the degree the Varesians were. The Varesians could easily run from a lot of things. And they have this constant conflict, the challenge of their environments, of the various human and non-human neighbors that they've been fighting against, they have been basically tempered in the forge of combat over these years. So they're tenacious, stalwart, and the other thing is um, they are very mistrustful of people, um, and they have do have this kind of general oath sworn to re retain their lost homeland. And um, they are honor-bound to defeat all that would dismiss them as just primitive barbarians. Because they really aren't. They aren't probably as developed in certain ways as you would say a lot of other inner sea cultures were. When you compare things to things like the Taldane, the Cheliax cultures and stuff like that. Because they probably don't have a little bit of the uh, scientific developments per se. But it doesn't mean they don't have a deep, deep and rich culture that is comparable to a lot of other groups there. So when it comes to giving a name to a Shawanti, it's very important. They're given a name at birth that's generally the one used during childhood. Uh, and later in their life, uh, a new name is uh, chosen by close family members or lovers. So they have this kind of early name that's their young name where they're a child. 
and then when they kind of get to that towards adulthood, they're given this, like, I, I would just, you know, I guess sometimes it's, it depends on the situation. Someone gives you a name, whether it's you choose them to give you a name, or someone in your family chooses them to give you a name, or it's like a lover you're taking when you've become like that age where you're getting into adult and taking a lover. Um, but you receive your adult name after a rite of passage during adolescence. And that's kind of linking into when you receive it. The who you receive it again, that kind of is varies. If a Shawanti is ever expelled from their tribe, uh, they generally revert back to their birth name, which is a sign of shame among Shawanti. Sorry, talking a lot, a lot of thirst today. Tattoos and that coming of age of the ceremony are very important too. So that's rite of passage is what they need to take before they're considered an adult. They complete this trial, they're granted their first tattoo. Each tattoo is specific to the individual tribe of Shuanti. Uh, they're tr the tattoos are chosen by the tribe's shaman and are drawn from a kind of cultural catalog of images and totems. So while overall Shuanti con uh, uh, catalog, the Shuanti catalog, Shuanti catalog might be similar between shamans, there will be kind of a unique versions of these catalogs that are for each tribe individually. So you might see some similarities between the sets of tr uh, tattoos Shuanti would have. Each one would still be unique enough that some they should be able to kind of you tell your tribe part by this. And you get that first one there, and a lot of times these tattoos, then, more that you get, are marks of honor and accomplishment. Um, so that's when you get your full name, uh, you know. And it's a phrase that generally is an honorific that will become your most uh, commonly used name. When it comes to religion, uh, they embrace a lot of religious beliefs. They have an ancestor worship, totemism. Though they also do venerate a number of Galarian gods, Desna, uh, uh, Gorum, Gozer of Phrasma, some of the very basic, natural, traditional gods that, you know, link up to a lot of the natural world, the cycles of life, they worship them, and then a little bit of that kind of totemism, to totemism and ancestral worship, which is kind of spiritual, ancestral kind of worship. So they combine these three things into their basic religious beliefs, you know, it's an it's a interesting combination of things. Um, there are some common terms for them, um, you know. And also noting, Shwanti aren't the only people that do some ancestor work. Some people in Tian and the Mwangi Expanse is also very important, just to note that. Um, the Shwanti still have a number of words that we, we do have Shwanti terms that have been defined by Pathfinder, uh, Asgat is the Shwanti name for a rune lord. Uh, Shentak uh, is a kid kicked in the head by a goat. That's quite of a thing. And uh, Tashemek, uh, for the Shwanti language, is a meaning for outsider. Um, and is very much so traditionally used against things like the Jalaxians and their descendants that have, uh, you know, invaded their region. Just a way to keep that in mind. So, I do not have... I'm going to talk about a couple different tribes here. So this is a Soken Kwa Shaman. I think it was particularly from a book or a source. It was from uh, the Lord of Runes book that was written. Uh, so the, the Rune Lords one uh, also comes from that book. Uh, the uh, Tashmek comes from Edge of Anarchy which is actually um, the adventure you're doing now in The Curse of the Crimson Queen. So that last term is actually from the book you've been in now. Um, there are some uh, things that are in... It, it, because the book is organized a lot different than Big Book, uh, in the original one they did give some information on some of the... Uh, in Corvoso itself, which includes the... There's a Shuabi population, Corvoso, some information on them, and it's revealed there, yada, 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 yada. Doesn't mean that you can't interfere, you can't run into them during your adventures here, I have information where Shuanti are. In Corvosa, you just haven't had to go there. Might, maybe not. So... There are seven main tribes, or quas, of the Shuanti, 
and they do have a common heritage, but they are still very different from each other in a lot of the ways that they have traditions, beliefs, and worldviews. Um, in most of the cases, loyalty to one tribe is paramount to the life of Shuwanti. Um, but what this means to an individual member of the clan, the tribe, is very specific to that individual clan. Um, there is occasions where a Qua will adopt non shuanti into the tribe, but it will never be an orc, half-orc, or Chalaxian, because those are seen as enemies, because there's been the constant battles with the Holes of Belkazin, which is a neighbor of them, and what's happened with Chalaxians. So that's why it was very acceptable for someone like uh, Evil Worm, who's here in chat, whose character in The Crimson Queen is a different species, and from originally people were from the Bwangi Expanse, to be adopted as Shuanti when they're traveling passed away. Um, some scholars do view the Ulfin descended horsemen of the Belish uplands as almost their own official eighth qua of the Shuanti, um, but the Shuanti kind of separate themselves from that kind of suggestion. It doesn't mean they might have a not of a common ancestry, but this group here might be more separated out into cultures, kind of d dating back with a separation from much more in the past. That doesn't really make them Shuanti anymore. Um, so open war between these Quas for resources, land, and politics are actually really rare, and it's seen as very distasteful. You know, it's, it's an extreme thing that these tribes have to go to wars themselves, and there are times that disagreements have escalated, but usually they tend to resolve with smaller skirmishes or battles that between chosen champions. So it'd be like a team of people that would battle for each side or champions that would battle for each side rather than all-out war. It, it still could be d settled through a conflict, just much smaller scale. So let's talk about the different tribes, the Shumanti. First off, we have, and I'm going to butcher some of these, I'm going to try not to, uh, the Lurunqua, the Moon Clan. Uh, they're the best archers and hunters of the Shawanti. Uh, they travel under the bright storable moon and hunt by the illumination of the stars in the vast racing sky. Uh, they're recognized that a well-aimed arrow is as effective, if not more so, than a whole band of raging brawlers. They have a territory in the Cinderlands of Varesia. Uh, typical tattoos from them invoke night, sight, wisdom. Uh, prestigious runes include uh, Narvik, the eyeless sight, Ion, the Great Moon, and Vinic, the Piercing Stone. Animal totems are hold, held in high regard for them, with uh, bat, cave bear, field mouse, mountain lion, owl, and wolf being very important. Nature totems of uh, moon, rainstorm, and stars are also revered amongst them. So that is your moon clan. Now the Shade Qua, the Axe clan, make their homes in the cliffs and dales of the Kalpshik Mountains in western Varesia and in the southern lands of the Lunar Kings. They're a little hardy, proud, they're, they are a seafaring people that have some experts, uh, with, uh, and a lot of them are expert divers or fishermen. And the uh, Sadequa are very mistrustful from outsiders and tend to attack intruders on sight if they are not Shuanti in heritage. The Sadequa have very little interactions at all, uh, if none, with the nearby town of Riddleport, another one of the major settlements in Varesia. And they perceive this settlement to be dishonorable and untrustworthy criminals, which is honestly mostly accurate. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Riddleplate, Riddleport is a very criminal-heavy place, so they're not wrong about their distrust of them. Their tattoos are themes of vitality, endurance, and oceans are valued. Uh, desirable runes are Vornak, many arms, uh, Dor Donak, the long arm, and uh, the endless journey. Revered totem, totems include cave bear, cliff, dire bear, eagle, sea, squid, and water element. <laughs> Sorry, blow my nose. I sure muted it. Uh, the Shirikiriqua, the hawk clan. Uh, this is the, of all the Shuanti tribes, the one that has the strongest animal affinity, and do revere these as holy and mystic. Um, they ever learn from the beasts which they share the land with, the Hawk Clan is perhaps the most peaceful of the Quas, uh, as they serve as emissaries to the outside world. Their connection to animals make them the greatest animal traders in Shawanti, and uh, they travel widely and can generally be found in north-central Varesia. Uh, their favorite track tattoos are travels, the wilds, hawks, horses, and other animals. Desire rooms are Rotomo, the headwind, Inger, the beast heart, and Ivac, the pack. 
Their clan totems are Air Elemental, Cloud, uh, Fire Pelt, Cougar, Forest Grove, Hawk, Hippogriff, Horse, and Wind. Then there is the Sundar Kwa, the Spire Clan. Uh, so we have the Shiriki, uh, I'm butchering their name, uh, Shirikiri, who act as diplomats to the outsider worlds. The Sundar Kwa are mediators between the various Shuanti clans. They have an ambition to see the Shuanti unified as one people, despite all the differences that the Seven Kwas have. The peace that generally reigns between all the Kwas is, in fact, largely due to their efforts. Uh, the clan reveres and dwells in the Thassalonian ruins in the Star Starville Plateau in Western Valkyrie. Uh, so they live in these old Thassalonian ruins. They revere it as a place of ancestors, where their ancestors came from. Kind of they did. Um, so their typical tattoos invoke watchfulness, the ability to lead. Their important runes are Dream Mill, the Guardian Heart, Cope, uh, Cope Kip, the Sentinel, and Clar Tiptil, the blood claw. Ah, oh, there's a... There's a claw. I don't know what a claw is off the top of my head, but apparently the claw Tiptil is the blood claw. Their clan totems are Earth Elemental, Mountain Spire, Rockfall, uh, Spire Stalker, and Stormrock. Um, some of the clan members travel with other claws. Occasionally, they will adopt totems of their host clans. So basically, because they are working at very peace, some of them will have this combination of tattoos for the Sundar Claw to kind of represent it. Now we'll just switch off here to a member of the uh, uh, next one we're going to talk about, the Sklarqua, the Sun Clan. And this is a uh, Kemetshit Flamestoker, which is a tribal warchief. Thank you. Uh, that makes sense then. See, like, that one I didn't have a reference to what it was very easily, and I would have had to look that up, and I hadn't done that today. But thank you. Thank you, Borg. So it's a tribal shield uh, made of an animal skull. That's pretty cool. So the Scalar Claw are the most xenophobic of all the Shuangi clans. I talked about how, like, the uh, Axe clan, the Shade Claw, doesn't like outsiders. The Scalar Claw really doesn't like. Uh, they are very fearsome and almost constantly at war. Uh, either fending off the orcs of Belkazin, the Chalice invaders from the south. Uh, they've learned to use heat and fire of the Cinderlands as a weapon itself. Uh, the Burn Riders revere a uh, horse above all animals. They dwell in the southern centerlands of the Storval Plateau. The tattoos they revere are showing flames in battle, especially comprising of the runes uh, Dam Kill, Orc Skull, uh, Ak Miz, Firehand, and Razkiv, Ember Skull. And popular totems are Aurochs, Cinder Snakes, and Ember Storms, Fire Elementals, Cougar Pelts, and the Sun. We only have two more clans to talk about. Skonqua, the Skull Clan, their lives are rent. Lives in the Skull Clan revolve around death. Whether fighting against undead, acting as guardians for uh, dis uh, the descendants of the uh, for the deceased among the clans, or tracking the oral history of the Shuanti people, they are kind of got this enigmatic and sinister members of the Skull Clan as a reputation. And they are sometimes troubled, uh, um, they're sometimes troubling to even most understanding of their fellow Shuanti. So they are the ones that fight undead, they lead, they lead the ancestors, you know, uh, guardians of the deceased, they track the oral history, they're kind of weird, kind of a little bit of sinister, kind of deal with stuff. They dwell in burial grounds in the eastern Cinderlands and the mine, uh, spot, mine spin mountains, so they make their homes in burial, gra burial grounds among the dead, which they act as guardians for. So, yeah, they're a little weird and different and interesting. Um, but, you know, they're not terrible. They actually have a good job and they are proper guardians in what they do. And they do track history of all the Shuanti people. So it's sort of like as much as they are living amongst the dead, they respect the dead in a very interesting way. So kind of got to respect them there. Uh, bones and Skulls are their favorite tattoos. Popular runes are Asmos, the Fever Dead, uh, Ere, Duty, Grax, Eternity. Uh, revered totems are Ancestor Spirit, Earth Elemental, Giant, Scarab, Beetle, Vulture, Willow, Wisp, and Wolf. And then the final clan is the Tamir Kwa, the Wind Clan. Uh, they are among the most territorial and secluded of Shuante people. They make their home in the mountains of northwest Varesia and southern land of the Winterkrims. 
and uh, basically, if you threaten their lands, whoo, you should not do that. Um, they are not friendly to people that threaten their area. Um, most of the time, they only interact with outsiders when they raid lowlanders for supplies. So, yeah. Uh, their tattoos often reflect speed, freedom, mountain homes. Uh, Runes of significance are Draw, Mist, uh, Sivlak, uh, Wind Soul, and uh, Sovala, the Rock King. Their main totems are Air Elemental, Cloud, Griffin, Mountain Peak, Snowflake, Storm, Storm Rock, and Wind. So, yeah. There's the Shuanti for you. Um, hope you got a good idea of them and their people. These people that are very interesting because whatever original history most of the people that the Thassalonians enslaved were, they brought them to the area of the Thassalonian Empire. And once it fell because of uh, Earthfall, these people were left to develop on their own and develop cultures on their own. And many of them have cultural connections to each other and the territory that they came from. You can tell that whatever the Shuanti were originally, this warrior culture was kind of instilled upon them over generations of being controlled by the rune lords. Becoming independent on their own hasn't changed that to a degree. It's already been ingrained in there, but certainly they've allowed to develop an interesting culture on their own. They respect where they came from. They respect the different spirits and elementals in the world. And they still respect a number of the more elemental primal deities that are out there. These are very primal things. When I mentioned Desna, Gorum, Gozera, Phrasma, they are more primal deities than a lot of other ones. Uh, Desna being the uh, a, a goddess of, you know, dreams and travel and freedom, which kind of reflects upon their uh, way of doing it. Gorum, a god of battle. Gozera, a god of nature, who connects up with a lot of their spirits. And Phrasma, the goddess of death. And some of them are goddess. But see, we have Battle, you know, travel, dream, or uh, travel and dreams, nature, and death. These are all important parts of them. Ancestor worship connects up with death. <coughs> I'm going to mute for a second. How to cough it. Connections with things like Gorum, connection with their culture, Gozera, their totemism, and even Desna with their way of life. Though they have these kind of set groups, they are still, in general, a often nomadic people. Not to say that each of their different uh, tribes doesn't have their central areas where they don't move from. They do have this way of probably moving around a lot within their territories and things. You might have more permanent settlements or semi-permanent settlements, depending on the different tribes. But it is connected with this idea of these deities that are old deities that connect up with a lot of what was going on with the Thassalon, connected with maybe maybe totemism and ancestor worship are something that the original people that were connected to the Shwanti that would become them had in them. Stuff that they remembered in the time for Thassalon and evolved with the connections with more with more deities as they were kind of discovered. It's hard to say exactly because we don't know a lot about what was going on pre-Thassalon. Thassalon's enslavement and control of a large platform portion of a vast year shaped the empire, shaped the continent, and shaped a lot of the humans that lived in that continent. Their influence was major. And the Shuanti are one of the people that feel it still today. And certainly more in recent years, the battles against the Chalaxians and the loss of their lands and their homeland has hurt them very much. And it's interesting to see that, like, their different tribal groups have felt more of it. And certainly, probably, some of the tribes who are more spread out have felt less of the influence of these outsiders, but they've seen what's happened to their brethren and probably don't really like it, per se. And, yes, you do have those that still try to, like, find a peace with this entire thing. Certainly members of the Hawk Clan, the uh, Shirikiri... Uh, Shirikiri are members that most likely would seek peaceful resolutions rather than that. They're connecting with the outside world. And 
they most likely are realistic in the thing that they can't really get rid of the people that are living there now. That's an impossibility. You know, the two cultures are going to have to get along, and even if they want to partially reclaim their homeland or be connected with it, they have to work with these people. But plenty of the other groups are more violent. It's each one of these, though they have a similar culture, are very unique and different to each other, which is interesting about the Seven Quads. They are unique in a lot of the ways they do it. And, you know, some places you don't want to visit, you get, you'll get hit because you're invading their territory. Some places you don't want to visit because they're going to think you as invaders. Some places are just violent to other people's, and then some will just welcome you as a friend. You don't know what you're going to get unless you understand the Shawanti culture, which is a very interesting and deep culture. There's, there are plenty of details on Shawanti culture we don't necessarily have, which is very interesting. We have this big chunk of it that does show us a lot about how they work, especially how the different quas work and plenty of their things like their tattoos, their naming ceremonies and such. This gives us an idea of the Shawanti, but it doesn't give us everything about them. And it would be interesting to see more about them in the future, too. But yes, I think that's this is a great place to leave it here. Again, the question for the day, uh, if you were in chat here or in uh, on YouTube, hey, have you played a Shawanti or been in a game with one? Let me know about any experience you had with people in the Shawanti culture and your inf interest in it. Um, other ways to support the channel, hey, up, up, you're up on Twitch. If you follow, be good if you're on YouTube. Uh, subscription there, like my video, the comment, as I said, you know, the bells, all that kind of jazz that they have. I have a Discord and a Twitter.com if you want to contact me socially immediately um whew. if you're looking for when i'm talking about these things if you want to join me live on twitch i stream them and record them every tuesday thursday saturday tuesday thursday is usually in the afternoon normally between one and two though sometimes a little earlier sometimes a little later depending on life schedule uh but we'll usually be on those days uh, Thursdays use the Pathfinder stuff. And then Saturdays, uh, late morning, uh, around 11 o'clock. So that's a lot more exact on schedule, and that's usually World of Darkness stuff. Uh, Tuesday's the variety stuff. Other tabletop stuff. Hey, I mentioned the Crimson Queen a bunch of time, where we've got some people doing uh, be, being a member of the Shawanti. That's Wednesdays, 9 p.m. EST. Check it out. It's a Pathfinder first edition game that we're doing based on the Curse of the Crimson Queen. I'm using that as a guide, uh, uh, basically an outline and guidebook, and then we're just do an adventure on our own, and it's been very fun and interesting, and I feel like we're finally hitting our stride with it, so definitely check it out. This was a good week this week. We should be up recording this week sometime. Uh, and then uh, every Saturday at 6 p.m. for discussing tabletop. Tabletop discussion, so go over news, deep discussion topics on tabletop. And the only other thing I can shout out is I do gaming streams on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, if you want to check those out. Those are fun. I chat a bunch. Anyway, I'm going to get going. I still have one more of them I'm going to do to the eight today, so uh, you know, check those out as they're coming up in the week. But until the next time, I bid all of you out there farewell.